And I want you to turn to chapter 22. We're beginning a new series today. I've entitled the series, Reaching for the Summit. Reaching for the Summit. About two and a half years ago, we felt that the Lord was leading us to have a new beginning, and we felt that we were to change the name of the church and have a new, new name. We began to pray about it, and the name that the church decided on was Summit Worship Center. We decided on Summit Worship Center for two reasons. The summit has to do with the highest point or the pinnacle, and that's where we as Christians desire to go. We want to reach for God's highest. We want to lay a hold of God's best for our lives. We want to reach that pinnacle of faith. Amen? And the second thing, we wanted our church to be a place of true worship. That it's more than fellowship. It's more than coming together and singing a song. It's about true worship where we worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords, we lift up Jesus, and as we lift up Jesus, all men shall be drawn unto Him. Amen? And so today, I want us to think about that as we reach, over the next four weeks, we're going to reach for the summit of four important issues. Now, there's another issue when you reach for the summit. If any of you have ever been in the military... What do the military strategists tell you to do? They tell you to take hold and conquer the higher ground. Because when you conquer the higher ground, guess what? You control what happens in the valley. Amen? Now, all of us love to go to Hatcher's Pass. We love the beauty. We love to slide on the the snow, whether it's on a snow machine or a sled or skis or whatever. We love to go up in the summer and see the beauty and, and the, the coolness and the freshness of the air. But guess what? We do not live on the top of Hatcher's Pass. We live in the valley. Amen? But there are issues in our life that we need to reach for, to take hold of, to reach that summit in those areas of our lives so that our lives are not filled with confusion and misunderstanding in the valley. Amen? We live in a society today that is filled with uncertainty when it comes to values, when it comes to what is right and what is wrong. We live in a, a society that is filled with relativity, where everything is relative, where that whatever circumstance that you face Depending on that circumstance, all things are relative. There is no absolute truth. And there's an ethic that is born out of relativity. It's situational, it's situational ethics. That's why our, our generation that's growing up in our country today is in such a confused state. That's why the administration is making demands in every state of our schools that we allow men to enter into the ladies' restroom if they associate themselves with a woman instead of a man. Hey, I'm just preaching truth. It's, there's a confusion in our land today because of relativity in our society, because of situational ethics. And it's time for the church to rise up and say, there is absolute truth in the Word of the living God. And when we apply it in our lives, then the valley makes sense. And we live our lives in the valley when we reach that pinnacle and we walk in absolute obedience to the Word of God. And I want to look at that today because I want you to not struggle when it comes to the issues that you face in this life and, and situational ethics says, well, whatever situation, I'm going to do whatever makes me feel good. And there's a way that seems right unto man, but it leads to destruction. So we have chosen to reach 
for absolute obedience when it comes to God's Word. Amen? Let's look at this great passage of Scripture. You are all familiar with this passage. You've read it many times. But as we look at it today, I want us to be reminded that Abraham didn't know how things were going to turn out. Let's begin with verse 1. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, now take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. This scene is taking place, it's going to take place on Mount Moriah. And the other Issues that we're going to look at in the next three weeks are all going to take place on top of a mountain. Verse 3, So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship. And, listen to this, we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife. And the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked. And there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place, The Lord Will Provide. As it is said to this day, In the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply your descendants of the stars of of heaven, and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. Can you imagine the shock of Abraham when he hears these words in verse 2? Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. I don't think that we can imagine The fear that must have come and attacked him. The bewilderment. The heartache. The pain that he must have experienced. If you have children, you understand just a little bit of what what this call would have been. And we need to remember that Abraham didn't understand the outcome. He didn't know that God was going to stop him. We read the story today and we read it and say, what a tremendous man of faith and praise God. God didn't call him to do that. But Abraham didn't know how it was going to turn out. Have you ever had God call you to do something that you didn't know how it was going to turn out? But He calls us to absolute faith. Now there were two great problems that he encounters. First of all, 
Isaac was the promised child. He was the miracle child that God had promised Abraham and Sarah. Now Abraham and Sarah, they got married late in life. And almost immediately God had promised them a child, but it was 25 years until the child was born. This child was a precious gift from God. They loved Him as much as any of us can love our children. And they rejoiced over Him because He was the blessed child, the child that God gave them, the miracle child. And God not only gave them Isaac, but God gave them a promise that through Isaac, Abraham would become a great nation. And now, imagine the the confusion that would grip him. He He would struggle with understanding, what is God doing here? Abraham was 100 years old, and Sarah was 90 years old. And finally, this precious gift comes to them. And in the book of Romans, chapter 4, verse 17, it reflects upon this time in their lives. And it says, God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they do. Aren't you thankful today that we serve a God that when death comes into our life, He has resurrection power that will overcome that spirit of death coming into your life. Amen? And He's still a God that calls those things that do not exist as though they do. Amen? He told Abraham and Sarah, Sarah whose womb was well past the age of childbearing, he said, you're going to have a child. To Abraham, whose body has also died when it comes to the point of having children, God said, you're going to have a child with Sarah. Now, this miracle child, God is saying, you need to sacrifice the promise that I've given you on the altar. And sometimes God calls us to do that. He'll give us a promise in our life, and it's bringing blessing in our life, but He wants us to lay that as a sacrifice on the altar to Him to make sure where our priorities are. Amen? When we look at Abraham, we say, wow. When we look at this point in his life, we say, what an awesome man of faith. But if we read the entire story of Abraham, and um, many months ago we went through this story of his life, and we looked at some of his experiences, and we pointed out the fact that there were times when he didn't trust God, when he didn't have faith, and what did he do? There were times when he was afraid for his own life, so he told the the people that he encountered in the new land in which he was in, he, he would say, well, Sarah is my sister instead of my wife. And he got himself into a huge mess. But there's something comforting about that, church. Have you ever done that? Have you ever had a lack of faith that got you into a big mess? But what I want you to see in the life of Abraham, there is hope for you, there is hope for me, church. Amen? As we reach for the summit of obedience, if Abraham can accomplish that goal and walk in obedience and walk in faith and trust in God, you and I can do it too. Amen? We can reach the summit of obedience. We can have that kind of faith because he was just a man and he made mistakes just like we do. Now, in the Scripture it says, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah. He knew the general area that God was calling him to. But he didn't know the specific place. But he's obedient. Abraham at this time would have been in Beersheba. It would have been in the southern part of modern day Israel today. And as he was going north, the Bible says that on the third day, 
they came to the place. Verse 2 says, on, the, on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. God doesn't give us many times the full plan. Amen? He'll set us off in a direction and we have to be obedient, but He's going to take us to His objective for our lives. We can trust in that. Do you think Abraham slept very well those three nights? I can tell you I wouldn't have slept a wink. Why? If it had been any one of my children, because I love my children, I thank God for them. And I would have tossed, and I would have turned, and I would have said, God, I don't understand. What is going on here? Why are you calling me to do this thing? This is the promised child. And look in verse 7, it says, Isaac asked this question, look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? How would you have felt having your child ask you that question? How would you have answered? I can just imagine being in his place and saying, Isaac, you're the promised son that we've waited for for all these years. And God's called us to go into worship on this mountain and He's directing us. He's guiding us. And when we arrive there, the reason that we do not have a lamb is because God's called me to sacrifice you. I can't imagine that. I can't imagine coming to that place where I had to share that with my child. And Isaac represents the promise that God is going to give him. That, it, that he, through him, he's going to have, have descendants and they're going to become a great nation. And there's something else. There's another problem with this. And that is the fact that it's contrary to the character and the nature of God. Abraham understood that God was not like the demon deities that the other people worshipped in that time. That they gave human sacrifice to honor them. He knew that that was not the heart of God. He had a relationship with Him and he knew that was not the nature and the character of God. And so there was a, a confusion here as to why would God ask me to do something that goes against His nature? But what I want us to see is in verse 3. Look at verse 3. So Abraham rose early in the morning. He didn't sleep on it. He didn't wait till noon and get up and say, God, I, I don't understand. I want to discuss this some more. I want to take a little time to think about this. This is the promised son. You said that through him, I, my descendants would become a great nation. I don't understand this. What did he do? He planned that night to be obedient. He said, we've got a long journey. The journey was going to be 50 to 60 miles and he, he said, we're going to get up early, we're going to prepare, because God said it, and we're going to go through with it. Wow. Now that's faith. And that's obedience to the Word of God. That's amazing to me. It's just amazing. Now some people would call this blind faith. Have you ever heard of somebody saying, oh, you Christians, y'all just have blind faith. You just believe anything. It's, it's just silly what you believe. Some people would look at Abraham's life and say, that's blind faith. But it wasn't. Listen to this, church. It was faith that sees deeper into the heart and the nature and the character of God than he had ever seen before. He knew in his relationship with God that God was good. That he was a father. That he could trust in the promises of God. So even though he didn't understand, he, did, he didn't, didn't have everything figured out, 
He said, I'm going to be obedient. And I'm going to walk the path that God's called me to walk. Abraham knew that God will never reverse his character. And the question is, was God teasing Abraham? How many of you like to tease somebody? Some of you do. I know you do. There's some hands. Well, I've got a little granddaughter that loves to tease me. And most of you know that, that my uh, grandpa name is Big Paul. That's what they call me. Well, one of my granddaughters, she, when she wants to tease me and play games with me, she calls me Piggy Paul. And I tease her back and I say, my name's not Piggy Paul. You quit calling me that. And teasing, a lot of times, even though we do it in jest or do it in fun, it actually wounds us. And people tease, but God doesn't tease. Now, was God tempting Abraham? No. God does not tempt. What is God doing? It tells us in verse 1. Now, it came to pass after th these things that God tested Abraham. God doesn't tempt. Satan tempts. And Satan tempts to prove us unworthy. God tests us to see the validity of who we are in Him, what we're capable of, and because He has planned for us something greater than what we think He has. <laughs> Amen? Now, when they design a new car, and they, they have the prototypes, and they take it out on the track, what are they doing? They're, they're driving the car to its top potential, to test and to see what it's capable of. And to see if it can achieve what it is designed to achieve. And that is what God does with us when He tests us. He is showing us that He, in Him, we are capable of much more than what we think we are. Amen? So God was testing Abraham. Now for Abraham, it was not negotiable. God said it, and so he was going to do it. And look at verse 7. Again, Isaac asked the question, look, the fire, the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And look at Abraham's answer, church. My son, God will provide. Aren't you thankful today, church, when you come to that place in your walk with God, when you face the times of promise that don't seem to make sense, when God's saying, lay them on the altar of sacrifice, when God calls you to that place, you can say with assurance, I trust God and I'm going to continue to walk in the path that He's called me to walk and my God will provide. I may not understand how, I may not understand when, but I know God's going to provide for this situation. Look at verse 5. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the, don with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. The Bible says that Abraham anticipated the plan of salvation of God. In fact, listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 8, verse 56. He says, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. This is awesome, church. There was such a faith and a walk with God in Abraham's life that God gave him a revelation and an understanding of the plan of salvation and he rejoiced in the fact that God was going to send his only begotten son to die on the cross. That his son was going to be the Lamb of God. I don't know about you, but that's shouting ground. Amen? Amen? That's shouting ground. 
Jesus gives us just a hint of what was going on there. And this was in a time, Abraham was living in a time before the messianic prophecies such as Isaiah concerning the suffering Messiah. We read many passages in Isaiah chapter 53, and one of them in verse 7 says, He was led to, as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearer is silent. So he opened not his mouth. This was three, uh, 1,360 years after Abraham that Isaiah wrote this. He didn't have the blessing of Scripture that was laying out the suffering of the Messiah, yet God gave him a revelation and an understanding where he saw Jesus' day and what God was going to do, and he understood that Christ was going to die for our sins, be rose again on the third day, and Abraham did his happy dance. Amen? He rejoiced and was glad in it. I love that. Later on, we see in the New Testament, the Apostle John saying in these words, For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It's interesting that in the Hebrew translation of the New Testament, the word for the only begotten Son is Yashid. And it's the same word that's used in Genesis chapter 22 for Isaac. Church, God had a plan. And He was showing a man His plan 2,100 years before Christ. I love that. Our text says that Abraham walked for a three-day journey. I want you to understand something, church. When God speaks to your life and He's given you promise, and you begin to be obedient like Abraham. You get up early in the morning you say, God said it, I don't understand it, but I'm going to walk in it. It's always longer than what we want. It may be three days. It may be three months. It may be three years. But if you continue to the end in obedience, the blessing of God is going to be manifest in your life. So stand strong if it's three days. If God's given you a promise, cling to it. Even if you don't understand it. Even if it seems He's asking you to place it on the, the altar of sacrifice. There's a reason why that Isaac was placed there. Abraham's faith could not be in Isaac as the promise. His faith still needed to remain in the God of the promise. Oh, come on, church. Amen? Our faith today isn't in the promise given us. It's in the God of the promise. Amen. It's in the God of the promise. The God whose character does not change. The God who's given us the promise. And we'll see, we'll see that the promise comes to pass. Oh, I'm th that'll preach. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Look at verse 9. Abraham comes to the place where Isaac is placed on the altar. When I was studying this passage this week, I came to this verse and the Holy Spirit just touched me. And God gave me a revelation fresh. I, I had seen it a little to little extent, but I had never seen it to this extent. what's happening here Isaac is bound he's placed on the altar verse 10 says Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son Isaac would have been at least a young teenager by this time Isaac does not wrestle against his father he submits totally to his father and allows himself to be bound and lays on the altar 
And the Lord spoke to me. Isaac wasn't living in his father's faith. That faith had been passed down to the next generation. And Isaac was responding out of the faith that he had for that same God. As a father and as a grandfather, I want to pass down that faith. He wasn't saying, well, it's dad's faith and I'm going to trust in dad's faith. Dad and mom had passed down the truth of God to their son. He, they had told him that he was the miracle child. They had told him that through him there was going to be a great nation. This was the promise of God for his life. And he took that truth that God had spoken over this family. And it wasn't only his dad's revelation. Now it was his revelation. And he was walking in the power of that truth. Oh, come on church. That ought to stir your heart today. We need to stand up and be men and women of faith and tell the next generation that the God that we serve is a God of promise. He's a God that His nature never changes. He loves you. He is for you. He's not against you. He is a God that is greater than everything that you can encounter. Amen. And when He's given you a promise, it may seem that that promise is going to be sacrificed on the altar. And if that promise is sacrificed on the altar, He's the God of resurrection power. He's the God of resurrection power that brings life where there's death. Abraham understood that. That's why he told the men, we're going to go to the mountain, the lad and I, and we're going to worship God, and we're going to come back. Because he'd have, he have a revelation of the resurrection power of God and the plan of God. He saw it begin to come to pass that he was illustrating that. And he believed that if he picked up that knife and pierced the heart of his son, that God was still a resurrection God who would breathe life back into that son and give him back the promise. Because he is a God that fulfills his promise. He believed God. Oh, come on, let that stir your heart. I want to be that kind of dad. I want to be that kind of grandfather. That my grandchildren growing up, they won't look and say, well, that's granddad's Jesus. But they'll say, that's my Jesus. And like Isaac, They'll trust and obey. They'll trust and obey. I love that. He continues in verse 10, Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. I can imagine as a father, the, the release. He probably fell to his knees. There were probably tears in his eyes. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. I can only imagine that type of release. And then he, he, he probably begins to loose the cords that had his son bound and they hear in the thicket a rustling and they turn and there's the ram for the sacrifice and notice in verse 14 and Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide as it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided Abraham didn't say God provided notice that that was a given. God did provide. But he was looking in that revelation that God was giving him, and he was saying, 
The Lord will provide. Over 2,000 years later, Jesus, the Lamb of God, would be put to death on a cross on Mount Moriah. And he understood that God was keeping his promise and that the Lord will provide. Are you thankful for that today? Abraham received the sustaining promise of God that had been spoken. But he is understanding the nature and the character of God Himself. Church, God calls us to obedience not for a ritual exercise, but God calls us to obedience because He wants to do something greater through our lives than what we think He can do. God wants to do something greater through your life than what you think He's going to do. There's some here today that you have a call of God to be a teacher, to be a preacher. All of us are called to give our testimony and to reach out and to be part of the harvest. But I want to ask you today, Are you ready to take that stance of complete obedience in the Lord? You can trust Him. He's always going to provide. And I love this. As as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Church, we're still proclaiming that today. (laughs) On a mountain... Mount Moriah, 2,000 years ago, the Lamb of God was given and it was provided. And God's still our provider. There's finally one more thing I want us to look at. I want us to look at verse 17. I'm going to invite the worship team to come forward. God compounds the blessing on Abraham's life. Look at this. God says, blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and as the sand sand which is on the seashore. When we walk in obedience, when we reach the summit of obedience in our lives, God says, I'm going to compound the blessing on your life. And then look what he says. Your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. God says not only is your obedience going to bring blessing into your life, your obedience is going to bring blessing into the lives of your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Can you say amen? The life that you live brings blessing or it brings cursing upon the generation behind you. And I, I, church, I can tell you that that's truth. I can tell you that I'm experiencing that and living that because of the blessings of my grandparents and my parents. They weren't perfect. They made mistakes just like Abraham. But they were people of faith. They continued to walk and to strive to live that life of obedience and live that life of faith, to walk that pathway. And church, because of that, the blessings were compounded in their life. And those blessings have flowed into my life, into my children's lives, and to my grandchildren's lives. And I especially like this part. Your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. That means the enemy is defeated. Gates have to do with access and egress. The enemy isn't going to have free reign to to come into their life and tear it up and and to to leave and come back again. They're going to have victory over the gates of the enemy. Will you stand?
Church, I believe that the next four weeks are a turning point for our church. They're a turning point for our lives individually and a turning point for our, our families and for our church. I believe that there are four summits that God wants us to reach and conquer and begin to walk in so that His blessings can be compounded in our lives. And He wants to assure us that we are capable of far greater things than what we think. The New Testament says that He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. And sometimes we just stop right there, but it doesn't stop. It says, according to the power that works within us. We have to be submitted to the Holy Spirit working in us. And part of that is saying, Lord, I'm going to listen to your voice. Whatever you call me to do, I'm going to respond with immediate obedience. I'm going to ask the prayer team to come. And if you're here today and you just want to come and pray, maybe you've walked in obedience and maybe your children and your grandchildren aren't walking for the Lord, aren't living for the Lord. I want you to come and to agree with one of these prayer on our prayer team and say, Lord, I'm claiming the promise in your word today. Or maybe you've struggled in, in walking in obedience. Maybe you, you've bought into some of that relativity that's so prominent in our culture today. And you want to reaffirm and say, Lord, there is absolute truth. And I'm going to be obedient to it. Or if you're here today and you've never opened your heart to the Lord, there's no better time than to respond and say, God, I want to get to know you. I want to surrender my life to you. I want to know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I want to know you just like Abraham knew you. Or if you have any need today, a need of healing, a need of deliverance, or you want to come and pray for someone else, we're a church that believes in prayer. Amen? Yeah. And prayer and coming to the altar isn't something that we're ashamed of. I come to the altar every week and spend time in prayer. It's a place where we come to speak with our God and to say, Lord, I am surrendered to you. As the worship team begins to play, will you come? Will you come today and respond to the Lord? Father, so in the days of old Would you do it again? Would you do it again? The story's told The miracles Would you do it again? Would you do it again? You said consecrate yourselves to me You will see Amazing things we need your revival, Holy Spirit fire, burning ever brighter in our soul. Kings and kingdoms falling, hear your people calling, King of Kings, we need a miracle. 